So I get to be in the unenviable position of standing between you and lunch and being running behind. So we'll try and make this quick. So by way of background, um, in 2013 of last year, or in, 20, in March of 2013, the FCC uh, CISR working group had this report on secure BGP. And most of what they were talking about was good, eat your vegetables, uh, get lots of exercise kinds of things. We all agree they're a good idea. Um, but they also had this mention of cautious stage deployment of RPKI route origin validation. And uh, it became my job to figure out how to do that. Um, so as I went through and tried to get prepared for deployment, um, I knew I had to dig into the details. And, I, and uh, I found out that while it is deployable, the uh, PR that's saying, yes, this is absolutely ready to go, and it's easy, and you should all just go do it, um, it comes with a couple of asterisks. So um, this is just my um, experiences. So. Um, this is, this is something where your mileage may vary, um, and not all of the concerns that I raise are going to apply to everyone, but I thought that it might be useful. And I have to follow up with the previous presentation somehow, so mine has cat pictures, because everything is always better with cat pictures. So rolling out security features, it's a typ typically a difficult thing, not necessarily because the technology itself is hard, but in terms of overcoming the inertia to actually do it in the first place. Uh, I think if we, if we think about it, we can all name lots of things that we could or should do in the security space, and the reality is that all of them require time or money or both, and most of the time knocking those resources loose um, really depends on who's the best at, at uh, pitching FUD uh, in order to scare people into action, or they're going to be reactive um, responses to things that you've already had happen to you, or they happen near enough to you that you can make a credible assumption they're going to happen to you. Um, so we give priority to bang for the buck. We look for good, fast, and cheap. And the things that we can do ourselves and still see benefit in terms of improved security. So that there's this question of, can I do it now? Do I have to do it now? Or can I defer it? And how long can I defer it before it becomes a problem? So since this is a system that needs wide deployment to really see benefit, um, providing the incentive to be more aggressive, deploy earlier in the curve of, of uh, fast movers, or first movers versus fast followers, uh, it's a little difficult. You either have to reduce the risk and the difficulty of deployment, or you have to increase the, the potential benefit so that the reward is worth the risk. Um, I know that there have been previous presentations here and other places on how route origin validation works but I figured it's useful to hit the highlights so that the words I'm using to, dis to talk about the stuff that I tripped over later will at least be in your short-term memory. Um, to caveat, when it comes to PKI, the only thing I know for certain is that I'm not an expert. So while I've tried to make sure that I have, I'm using the right words, apply salt as necessary, and there are folks in the audience that will be happy to correct me when I'm wrong. Um, the assigning part of our PKI is you're generating a cryptographically verifiable object. Um, and it basically shows that you're the legitimate holder for a given ASN prefix and uh, the prefix, length, prefix and prefix length combination, and then publish those things where the world can find them so that others can compare what's in the routing table to what you're saying is allowed to be in the routing table for a given prefix. Um, the publication is a hierarchy. It starts with the trust anchor, and it walks down to the different publication points that the trust anchor, anchor references. Um, the trust anchors will have a bunch of URIs that point to the different certificate resources and their publication points for a set of resources. Um, some of these resources may then point to other child certificate authorities, and the system will basically walk the tree to find them all. Um, the relying parties have to sync with all of them in order to have a complete view, and then they actually do the heavy lifting for the validation of the signed objects. They look at the actual crypto, um, so that there's this first uh, valid invalid test about the keying material. Is the row valid or is it not? If the crypto doesn't validate, then the row gets tossed out, and unless there's another row, um, those routes are considered unknown. If the crypto does validate, then the data on that row is added to the list of prefix and ASN mappings that the RP is caching, um, and, and then that gets sent to the router. And then the router looks at all the different prefix ASN data to determine which ones are covered and, and match what it sees in the routing table. 
Um, that info doesn't really do anything by itself. It's just putting, providing input to the routing policy engine, and that's where you actually make decisions about what to do with the different types of prefixes. Um, there's basically two models of, of sign, signing prefixes that I'm going to talk about. Um, the hosted model is sort of easy mode um, because a lot of the more complex PKI stuff that you would have to deal with gets farmed out to a third party to babysit. Uh, this is the model that gets used for the presentations you might have seen about RPKI signing an entire country um, or an IX's worth of providers. The caveat with this is that it means that you have to be able to trust that the third party knows what they're doing with PKI. Um, in a lot of places in this, in this slide presentation, I'm going to pr refer to Aaron specifically. Um, they're my RIR, so that's, I'm most familiar with, with their policies. Um, and there's certainly a lot of places where you could substitute your local RIR for Aaron, but um, because I'm not as familiar with their, their methods and their policies, your mileage may vary. Um, the difficulty here in terms of a hosted service is that when it's good, it's great. But when it's bad, it's really bad because you have very little control over what breaks um, or why it breaks or when it gets fixed. And you don't have a lot of control over the chain of custody for things like your private key. Um, ultimately, you have to think about this in terms of the difference between the SLA that you offer your customers and the SLA you're offered for this hosted service. If you're relying on the service, you've just applied a limit to your SLA or taken on an additional risk of violating it. And so we're back to the question of risk versus reward in terms of what's the benefit of deploying. Um, you also, because of the way that this works, you have to have some solution to manage um, signing requests for your customers that you've delegated PA space to. Um, since they don't have any formal relationship with Aaron, you have to proxy those requests. This is a lot like updating who is to uh, reflect delegation. Um, but it's probably going to require some additional automation and portal work on your part to make everything play nice and not be manual. Oops. Yes. So the other model here, if you'd rather control a little more of your own destiny, is um, you end up having to do a little more work on the PKI side. If you're already familiar with PKI, this might be easy. If you're not, it's a lot more complicated. Um, one of the things I highlight here is key management. Because um, the way the software is packaged for this, um, it does have the setup that you could run it all on one box um, if you want. Or you can have one box for your relying party and one box for your certificate authority. But if you only use one box for your certificate authority, you end up with private keys stored on a publicly reachable server, which may not be a good idea. So it, it, it sort of requires you to split your certificate authority across two boxes. Um, so that you have the machinery to sign things with your private key on a private box, that's the actual certificate authority, and then the machinery to do the publishing on a public box, that's the publication point. Um, and then you'll likely also have that separated from the relying party simply because it's sort of a different set of um, requirements for those boxes. You still need the same machinery to handle some downstream customer delegations, but in this case the system's all in your control so you're not having to worry about making it talk to a third party. Mm, mood lighting. Um, and in either case, you're still going to be using Aaron's TA for part of this. Um, and there's some questions about the way that high, avail high avail availability might work in this, in this setup. So no matter which model you use, you're going to have to generate some ROAs. And that means you need to know what prefixes, prefix-like ranges, and which ASNs you need to assert. If you can't answer these questions with reasonable certainty, then you can't really be sure you're signing your prefixes correctly. And if you sign them incorrectly, say if you sign a supernet from which there, you have delegated subnets and they're being originated by a different ASN, you might make those su subnets invalid. And for people who validate, that means that those routes are going to get dropped and those customers are gonna go offline. Um, for those of you who saw Randy Bush's talk in the security track yesterday, you've seen proof that this is exactly what's happening. And so clearly we need to be paying closer attention to this. But fortunately, everyone has a great database for IP address allocations and which ASNs are associated with them and in their IP address management software. So this is just a matter of connecting the RPKI machinery to the API, right? I know I do. So it is possible to compensate some for dodgy records by signing broader ranges. Uh, if you don't know how far you might, might delegate a subnet, 
Um, you can generate a row, so it includes a prefix range for the, the supernet all the way down to a subnet. And uh, if you have multiple ASNs like my network um, and you aren't sure which one might originate, you can generate a row for both ASNs. Um, but generally, you're, the, better, the more granular you can be in your signing, the better protection you're going to have. And you still have to know what you've allocated to, to other customers so you don't take them offline. Um, you can also do things like baseline your um, info for building the row is by just sim simply dubbing, dumping a copy of your BGT BGP table. Um, that's going to give you reality and it's going to be more accurate than a database. But it's only useful as sort of an initial bootstrap because if you keep using this as a way to keep things in sync, you're not independently confirming what should be correct against what actually shows up in the table. And that sort of defeats the purpose of route origin validation. Um, this is probably a good, as good excuse as any to fix some of the tooling problems that are causing database rot in the first place. And uh, you know, if you already had to do an IP address audit, this is a good, good reason to do it. And once you've signed, you have to look at the um, validation for everyone else's prefixes. So that means you're looking at uh, setting up relying parties and doing some configuration for um, routers uh, in order to take advantage of it. The building, building the RPs with enough redundancy is pretty easy because you can have multiple um, relying parties in the network in different places. And um, you can sort of put them where they make sense in terms of proximity to the routers and, and uh, how much ge geodiversity there is. Um, but you do want to think about the, uh, the bootstrap case, which is, you know, so how, how does a router reach the RP to do validation when it first comes online? so that you can avoid the case where the router comes online, converges, and then has to reconverge once it can actually reach the RP and have validation information. So um, the, one of the issues here is that most folks already have um, existing local pref policies that they use to set and manipulate and move traffic around in the network. Um, I have to be careful about the union of this existing policy plus the new policy that you're putting in for RPKI to make sure that it does what you want. Um, it might require that you have to set a, uh, a range of different local pref values for valid and unknown based on what the existing value was and some logic around that. Um, and then the other thing here is since I have multiple ASNs, my definition of things like an AS border router is a little hazy. Um, you know, I, I have the option of either trying to carry validation state, which is a, technically a non-transitive community across my internal AS boundaries. Um, or I can do, do validation at multiple edges. There's sort of pros and cons to both. Um, some of it, it has the bearing of how many routers actually need to do the RPKI capable code, how much configuration I'm doing, how many need to talk to the RP versus simply looking at the local prep policy and doing something in routing policy like they do today. Um, what I came up with is that it's best to validate at the actual edge of the network so that you're already, you're, you're dropping invalid routes as soon as they come in and um, you're not having to do revalidation and then since we already have machinery to do things like carry local pref across AS boundaries using communities, you can use the exact same machinery and have this be a little more seamless. So when you start putting servers and applications into the cr critical path for the network, it breaks uh, our fairly tidy idea of keeping applications and network in separate organizational silos. And we see some versions of this today on SDN because you're often seeding part of the control plane from the routers, which are managed by one group, to an application running on servers, which are typically managed by another. This adds more fun because it includes all this mucking about with PKI, which may either have been an applications function, the guys who already deal with TLS certs, or it might be a security function because it's about handling of secure information, or it might be both. Um, the, I think the, the uh, answer is a little easier for the relying party since it's already talking to the routers and has a fairly limited role on the PKI side. But the CAA is a little bit of a gray area um, because it's more of an application like, say, DNS, but it has this risk that it causes routing problems for your customers if it breaks, such that the routing folks might still want control. Um, it also has this requirement for some knowledge about PKI which may not be in the router jockey's area of expertise. I know it's certainly not in mine. So there's a learning curve there. Um, if you split signing and publication, it, it gets a little easier because then the compartments start making a little more sense. Uh, the publication point is just an application that's ma maintained like, like any other critical external application, like DNS. And it's just taking input for the data accuracy from the network uh, folks, and so there's there's a, there's a little more uh, simplicity there. And then the CA is managed just like any other CA would be. Um, 
this ownership question is absolutely not a technical problem. It's a layer eight and nine problem, but it's definitely something you have to consider when deploying in a large network. Okay. So getting any new technology is deployed, uh, getting it deployed is hard because it requires some sort of either a flag day or good support for incremental deployment. CIDR has good support for incre incremental deployment, which I think is realistic in this case. But when you think about what I said a few slides ago about when the actual benefit for deploying comes, uh, incremental deployments are a little bit of a tough sell. And I'm generally a big fan of the, the notion of failing open because it's a lot safer protecting you for lots of, of uh, miscellaneous cases you didn't think about. But the trap we sometimes fall into is that fail open gets used as a crutch to reduce the, the risk and the, the perceived risk and severity of the, of the potential failures and um, in order to kind of limit the problem space you're looking at. And I think we may have swung a little too far in the other direction where it starts creating a disincentive to deploy. So when I talk about the, the system here, um, I'm looking at the overall set of moving parts and how they act as a group. Um, different pieces have different levels of influence. Uh, most of the concerns around availability are related to the CA or the TA as the source of um, author the authoritative info. If you split out the certificate authority and the publication point, it's the publication point that actually matters from an availability perspective because unless certificates are expiring, there's, it's okay to have a small delay in being able to generate new side objects. Um, there's some paral parallels to DNS in this system in terms of the rate of change and the failure model. Um, you think about it, lots of pieces can be down for brief periods and it's okay because the info is cached and it doesn't get stale immediately. And the parts that, are, that must always be available are duplicated and geodiverse, your root servers, your auth servers, things like that. Um, however, RPKI doesn't have the benefit of multiple duplicate and diverse authoritative data sources because right now there can only be one URI for, for the, the TA and it can only point to one URI for a CA for a given set of resources. So when one of those is down, that info goes unavailable. Um, part of the catch there is the, the RP does cache the URIs for the CA so it can hit them directly if the TA disappears. And it caches the info it gets from each CA. So this is more a matter of the, how, how it handles things like staleness and expiry and how it handles initial bootstrap. So when you bring a new RP online for the first time and it can't reach something, or if you bring it online after some failure that affected its persistent storage. Um, unavailable is also just unknown routes. So things aren't technically broken, but we've failed open again and fallen back to no protection. So again, I'm losing the benefit that I've deployed to gain in the first place. Um, there are certainly ways to use load balancers or DNS priority to work around the single URI, but given that we're using rsync here, that's a little curious. And um, I just sort of have the feeling that high availability load balancing, um, trying to do geodiversity in order to work around this problem seems kind of overly complex for something in the critical path of the routing infrastructure. So the goal with distributed systems like this is you want the rate of, rate of change to be slow enough and the synchronization to be fast enough that you're actually in sync most of the time, or at least longer than you're out of sync. Um, but with this system, it's hard to know when that sync is, is actually achieved, because there are no serial numbers like a DNS zone. And so what you end up having to do is choose an update and synchronization frequency that keeps pace with that rate of change. Um, but we don't know that for sure at scale, and so there's some trial and error there. Um, and as the system grows, the current way that we distri distribute things is likely to encounter some scaling problems. You can see in the reference presentation there's a better discussion about those scaling issues. Um, but it's likely to make sync harder, especially if we get more aggressive and more frequent in the way that we do our synchronization. Um, we can certainly gain some improvement by throwing the right switches in our sync and tuning the file system, doing things like that. Um, but there isn't really one document that says this is the best practice of the way to do this, and so even that is going to be trial and error. Um, if we were to change the design a little and add a, uh, some sort of a hierarchy so that every RP isn't talking to every CA, um, we have the problem of inconsistent info may, may providing um, wider damage. So I think this is a matter of, of better defining what's an accept acceptable level of consistency so that we, we uh, avoid failing open more than necessary 
and kind of keeping in mind what can happen when we have inconsistent data that conflicts and then causes the wrong choice to be made. So even if the system is available and internally consistent, there's some risk that the data is garbage, whether it's accidental or purposeful. Um, some of the garbage data goes back to fail open. If you have an invalid certificate, um, that just gets trashed and any prefixes that, are, that would have matched it are considered unknown. Um, but there are other cases where the certificate is valid, but it's wrong, and that does more damage because routes that are found to be invalid are dropped from the table. There's also um, a parent-child hierarchy between certificates that um, basically it makes the process for revocation and reissue like you might do in a transfer sort of fiddly and fragile. Um, there's an order of operations question here, and if you want more details about this, you can look at the draft here or um, talk to Jeff Houston because I could waste a lot of time on it and still not explain it as well as he can. And I don't have a cool accent. So it's not nice to show up at a, a, a Nanog and talk about all the warts of a system without talking about some possible solutions, even if they're sort of simplified and non-expert solutions, so I gave it a go. Um, most of the things we learn about the internet and, and how it works is building a reliable uh, network out of unreliable elements. So my focus for improving availability is on removing some of those single points of failure I highlighted. Um, in this case, removing the dependency on single URIs and allowing more than one discrete host name and domain gets us a long way towards minimizing those failure cases for accessing the, the authoritative info that we need for the system. Um, and it, does so without requiring the overhead of something like a load balancer. We, we could certainly use any cast as an alternative here, um, but with our sync that leads to this assumption that during failure, the session would have to re be reset and start again with no state, and um, that pushes us toward a, a much more rigid need for consistency between the different systems at scale. Um, the reference here to ditching our sync, you can certainly look at that presentation at another time when we're not trying to hurry to get to lunch. Um, because it's been well documented some of the issues that we're seeing with rsync in this system. Um, there's sort of two, two types of consistency that matter here. Um, synchroni synchronization between the um, CA publication points and with the RPs that talk to them. That's, that's a looser sort of consistency. And then there's consistency among the redundant authoritative elements in the system, which has to be a lot more rigid. The um, <coughs> The publication point to RP sync is, is likely to be limited by the scale as a function of how long it takes to actually sync and by how, how we determine when things are stale, how often they must be refreshed, how, do you, how often you do a recheck. Um, one possible idea in the draft I'm referencing here is it makes this work a little more like a DNS zone transfer. Um, otherwise what we end up, we, we also have some possibility to get gain some scale improvement by doing something like atomically syncing a sync signal file um, rather than thousands of individual files. Um, the sync between uh, individual CAs that are redundant for one another or TAs, you could do that via atomic sync as well. At the TA level, um, what this might mean is that Aaron's TA backs up RIPES and vice versa or that Aaron actually publishes two but they always stay in absolute sync like a pair of DNS root servers. Um, at the CA level, you can use a similar idea, but local to a given CA administrative domain, um, if I have more than one server with a set of certs that I publish, and when they change, I push the changes globally to all the CAs that I manage as close to simultaneously as possible. Um, so they all have the same view of the universe. Um, that way, it doesn't matter which one you ask, you're gonna get the right answer, or at least a consistently wrong one. Um, RPKI has similar data accuracy problems to routing databases and who is, um, the, the data does rot if you don't keep it updated. Uh, some, of, some of the things, some of those get solved in this case with a combination of automation and the fact that if you let the data stale, it causes outages. But it still requires some focus. Um, ensuring the, the accuracy and, and protecting against the mistakes and fraud often comes down to the, the process that gets followed and how rigor, rigorous it is. Um, we already know how to do authority and, and authentication for managing things like TLS certs. This just sort of applies it to a new space with new players. In this case, RIRs aren't root CAs in the context of TLS, so there's a learning curve there. Um, the legal side is a little un unknown and potentially nasty. Um, there's a question about who is allowed to use this to take you offline. You can do things like revoke, cert revoke cert certification, 
um, issue AS0 cert certificates that make any announcement invalid. Um, it, so it sort of starts looking like um, where we end up blocking content for filtering or DDoS or issuing a legal takedown to a content provider to shut down a website. Um, it's not clear that there's any sort of precedent or burden of proof that this happens the right way with proper justification and documentation and that it's done such that there is no collateral damage. Um, that's, that's not a protocol or technology problem either. It's, it's a policy one, but it's a very real issue that I think we need to sort out as a community before it starts getting legal tests because then it becomes a matter of sorting it out reactively and I think that's gonna go badly. Um, I think Randy Bush was the one that coined the phrase Dutch court attack. Um, as a way to describe this, and you can see some of the discussion that's already happened around this if you look for those terms along with RPKI in your favorite search engine. So most of the things that I've talked about thus far are solvable uh, technology problems or policy gotchas or things like that, but this really is the, the primary reason why my company is not proceeding with, with deployment. Um, Using Aaron's trust anchor requires signing a relying party agreement with Aaron, which is a legal document. So in preparation for doing so, I passed it through our lawyers, and they told me that this wasn't acceptable for production deployment. Um, I'm not a lawyer, and your counsel may see this differently than ours did, but after some discussions with some folks who are lawyers, we were able to sort of distill this down to a couple of um, significant things we think need to be changed in order for us to consider signing any agreement around this service. So some reads of indemnify and hold harmless mean that if we're both party to a lawsuit, we're required to defend not just ourselves um, to show that we're not at fault, but also defend Aaron. So that opens up a lot of risk for us as the user of this service. Regarding the warranty statement, um, the reason I bring this up is that um, we've already had the arguments about free and open source, and our lawyers have made their peace with that. They're not happy about it, but at least it's something we don't have to re-argue. Um, and that... That, that makes it one less thing that we have to battle on. Um, ultimately, though, there's a lot of boilerplate that absolves Aaron of any responsibility to make the service reliable, accurate. Um, the, the certificate policy statement, the CPS, it helps by defining the process, but it has the same disclaimers. Um, and it, in order to be clear here, my goal isn't to try to be able to sue Aaron if things go pear-shaped. My goal is to know that Aaron has some level of skin in the game to make sure that this mission critical service is available, consistent, and contains accurate data with reliable safeguards against fraud and preventable outages. Um, that helps to reduce the risk I take on by participating. Um, this last bullet here is probably the biggest barrier to RPKI deployment in North America. Um, I, in some ways I can understand the need to have Aaron members sign an agreement covering the terms of the service that Aaron is providing to them. But requiring any RP to sign it, even if they don't have any business relationship with Aaron, is rough, would be roughly equivalent to VeriSign requiring you to sign a legal document before you're allowed to query the servers to find out where .com is. It would just mean that no one would use .com. Um, if, and this may be a problem of legal risk. Um, so perhaps there's a structure that allows Aaron to assume the right level of risk with a fee that covers this. You know, that ultimately this is a free and opt-in service right now and we're getting what we pay for. Um, but given the potential importance of this service, maybe that's not the right model. Thank you. So some of this may come down to a fundamental question about whether the RIRs are even the right entities to be in the critical path for this infrastructure in terms of the resources that they need to commit, the expertise and the policy around it. Um, given the way that this has the potential to interact with global routing, we probably have a ways to go to move from RIRs don't set routing policy to RIRs as a critical element of the routing system. And the policy development process is one of those areas we're going to have to evolve so that there's a bottom-up open method for its members to direct how this system is implemented and managed. Um, so to use Aaron as an example here, other than the suggestion box and the Aaron Discuss email list, both of which I think we've already tried, Standing here today and discussing this publicly where hopefully we have some Aaron members listening is the only way I know to influence this. That seems to be a bit of a problem in terms of making sure that this is done in a way that we can have confidence in the system. So this is a little snarky and I'm not, I'm not saying any of these things are particularly hard. There's a learning curve with anything new. But I think the point here is that we need to be making 
we need to be thinking in terms of making the learning curve less steep and the system more robust and there's more incentive to deploy more widely. Um, as I said before, I don't think that RPKI is undeployable. I just don't think it's ready for deployment yet, and as a result, I think there's a set of things that we should be focus focusing on that we know work now, with the idea that as R RPKI continues to evolve, it'll provide further improvement over the things we can do today, some of which I've listed here. But RPKI isn't going to improve if there aren't enough people poking at it, and looking at the areas where it's in need of improvement. So I'm hoping that this will show you that there's a good reason to spend more time getting familiar with how you might do this on your network so that there are people smarter than me trying to find, the, find and, and or fix the holes. So I, my time says I have 25 seconds left. Um, I don't know whether we have any time for questions or whether we're running to lunch. We could take one question. Well, look, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, real quick. So, uh, uh, name and affiliation and question in the form of a comment. What? It's a question. Uh, so, uh, Wes, John Curran, President and CEO, Aaron. Um, and I Hi, actually John. think, sorry? I think the slide's very good that you did these slides. Um, the question is with respect to the, the legal agreements, obviously. And, um, you know, there is uh, uh, currently multiple regions, other RIRs also contain such language. TWC's business class service agreement contains the same indemnification language as it turns out. So it's not unheard of to see indemnification language. Having said that, it's true that there's a risk involved. And so by offering the service, there's a risk. And you don't want to end up losing an entire registry because something happened. And much like you want to make sure Aaron has skin in the game, we want to make sure people using this take the right precautions in case it fails. So they don't, you have the right filters, you have the right checks to make sure if there is a failure of a system, you don't destroy your own routing. So everyone's trying to make sure everyone has the right protections. Here's my question. You said Aaron members should get involved, and I think that's great. I would like the NANOG to know if the NANOG members can somehow get involved and actually participate maybe in one of the Aaron sessions and tell us what you need, and in particular, is if there was a paper delivered from NANOG, if you would lead a group to propose an answer, would you do that? Because that might be compelling on how the Aaron board makes a risk decision. Yeah, I, I think there's probably more discussion that has to happen around what the right model is to address these kinds of things, because this is, this is one of a number of different sort of operationally focused things that don't fit into NRPM right now, and therefore, you know, we definitely have more work to do there, and I'm happy to, to do what I can in order to, to move that forward. Okay. Um, I think as far as the legal wrangling is concerned, some of it is, you know, lawyers talking to lawyers or whatever. Um, I don't think that this is necessarily about whether everyone has indemnify in their, in their contracts or not. I think that's probably our going on minutia. Well, for example, the, RPK, the RPA that you click to get the key, people complain that Aaron's the only region that to get the trust anchor, you have to go click and agree to the RPA. We could just put it in our CPA, CA um, terms of service, which is what AP Nick does. AP Nick says anybody who gets this cert agrees to indemnify AP Nick, okay? If you want it hidden, rather than having it explicitly visible, we can do it. But, right, so I mean, it, it, may, it may actually be a question of how it's legally presented. Right, and, and some of this also is a matter of like, I, out of curiosity, when I was looking at this when I was preparing, the, um, the CPS, I compared yours right up against um, RIPES, I believe was the other one I used, I don't think I looked at APNICS. Um, yours has all the legal, legal boilerplate in it, RIPES doesn't. Right, but there's a difference here. The member agreements are only applicable to the members. The folks that use their TA are not in that same situation. And that's the point I'm making here, is that there's, there's a distinction that we need to make between what, what service agreement exists between Aaron and its membership using the service versus folks that are simply third parties trying to get information that their members want them to have. Is there time to take one more question? Uh, please, please go ahead, Sandy. Hmm? Please, please go ahead. Okay. 
uh, Sandy Murphy Parsons. Uh, some points that you made that are technical because I'm not a lawyer. Um, the multiple publication points for the trust anchors is already a uh, draft in the CIDR working group and uh, is working group last call. Um, there was a suggestion of doing multiple publication points for individual CAs that's kind of uh, going slower. Uh, you talked about having multiple, uh, an analogy to the DNS system. I kind of would hope that we would take some of the lessons we've learned over the many, many years of deployment and think about using some of the techniques in multiple route servers and replication. And I don't how, know how they manage the, to keep all those things consistent, but you would think there would be lessons learned there. Um, the CA and the private key and the publication point, there is a publication protocol. So if you, in the CIDR working group set of documents, if you wanted to outsource the publication and have the publication point handled by somebody else, uh, there's a publication protocol so that you can talk to them and uh, separate those two functions and not do one of those yourself. And uh, about the indemnity clause in the RPA, RPA, I'm not going to address that. That's a legal concern. There is one technical point in there about not being allowed to share the data with anyone else so that everyone has to go to Aaron to get the data. Um, and, and that has certain ramifications on our architecture and being able to get the data from your neighbor when you start up a new ISP or a new connection. Uh, and that's a technical concern, not a legal concern. Well, right. I mean, I know that it derives from a legal concern, but it's Yeah, and, and there's, I can understand some of the reasons why Aaron has that requirement in there, but I think there's probably, that's another one of those areas where there has to be some more discussion f to figure out what the right balance between technical and, and legal protection yeah. is there. Right. Okay, thank you. So one last question. This will be real quick. Um, just a plus one on the on the deal breakers, and I think that to answer John's question, I think slide 21 in this presentation does a really good job. By the way, I'm Mike Sinatra of VSN. Sorry about that. Um, John, uh, John, to answer John's question, slide 21 in Wes's presentation does a really good job of, I think, explaining what needs to be done and, and really what the framework ought to be. Um, basically, I can't ever sign this, that particular RPA as it is. It's illegal for me to do that. So um, we can, you know, we can talk about changing the laws of the state of California as they apply to state entities, but that's the way it is. And this is a, this is a very strong third party indemnification clause that's in there. Not all indemnification clauses are the same. So that's all. John said, John said, I'm bound. You're bound by it if, by AP Nick, just by touching the certificate because it's, I, so I, I'm going to suggest that this is a great conversation to happen during yeah, the Aaron ask, meeting. Ask a California lawyer. About it. But, but let's all yep, let's, let's call it here, guys. Thank let's you. Let's offline it. Thanks. But you know these kinds of agreements are making it very hard to deploy this stuff.